Welcome to the car guys. This week we test drive the Range Rover Vogue SE. That's right. If you remember in our Bentley and Rolls-Royce Cullinan videos, we both said we preferred the Range Rover and now it's time to find out why. The Range Rover was launched in 1970. It's been the same boxy, beautiful British shape since then. And for me, I have to say, I don't think there's a better looking 4x4 SUV out there. They hit the nail on the head when they first designed it. And thankfully, they haven't tried to muck around with it like maybe they did with the Defender. You're certainly not gonna miss it, especially in black like this one is. But look at these massive chrome alloys as well. I mean, this is pimping. Downside of that, of course, is very easy to scratch. Yes, very. Super imposing grill. I mean, look at that. Get out of my way, you peasants. Fourth generation Range Rover. So they haven't really changed a lot over the years. This one is actually the pre-facelift from the current version. There's a couple of minor changes to the bumper, exhaust pipes and uh, touch screens inside, but nothing you'd really notice. The shape of the Range Rover in its essence has not changed very much like 911. You could spot a Range Rover from a mile away even if it hasn't got a badge on it. One of the features that I really like about the this version from 2012 onwards is these gills. They look absolutely brilliant, really add a thing to it, especially following into this particular design feature that runs down the side of the car. You get a choice of two three litre V6s in this range. You then have the four and a half litre V8 diesel and you've got a couple of five litre petrol monsters. I think the pick of the range is this four and a half litre V8 diesel gives you the best compromise between performance and fuel economy. So this Range Rover rocking 22 inch alloys, 22s. I mean, the only thing that's gonna make this more gangster is if these were spinners. No, they're not. Remember all those shots of Range Rovers and Land Rovers wading through the water, sloshing over the bonnet? Yeah, it's not quite what happens in real life. The effective wading depth of this Range Rover is 900 millimeters, which for you folks at home is just below the tire. So you can basically drive with water up to that level, but no more, or it will conk out. You can go one or two ways with, with a Range Rover, mm. particularly like this. You can either go slightly tasteful, retaining some of that chrome, keeping mm. it a little bit, you know, classy. a little bit hoity-toity, a little bit classy. Hoity-toity, <laughs> excellent. Or you can black it all out and become a uh, murdering drug dealer. Orcs. 0 to 60 is 6.8 seconds, which for a four and a half litre V8 lump weighing two and a half tonnes. It's not bad. It's, too, it's all right, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I too think bad. that's fairly reasonable. 334 brake horsepower, top speed 135 miles an hour. That is a little bit shabby though, isn't it? I'm not sure I'd want something this big and this heavy traveling more than that no? towards me on a carriageway. <laughs> I don't think I would want that. I think there should, I think all of these vehicles, and I'm, and I'm looking, looking at you, SVR, <laughs> I think they should all be limited to about 110. <laughs> because just imagine the sheer momentum and the physics the inertia, involved. The yeah. inertia of that vehicle, yeah. Peak torque is 545 pounds foot or 740 newton meters for your metric people. It allows you to pull three and a half tonnes of weight. Horse box, basically, is what we're saying, aren't we? A couple oh, of horses in it. It's a bloody big horse it's box, a big horse box. Two big, lardy, shire horses. Welcome to another episode of I Can't Find uh, the Catch for the Bonnet. So let's see how much of the engine we can actually find underneath the bonnet. I don't think it's going to be a lot. Ta-da! Yeah, we were right. One of the classic features of Range Rover, which has been through every single generation of the car, is the split tailgate. These things are used by the gentry on the polo trips, and it serves as a nice little seat. So as you know from our last video, Rolls-Royce stole this idea completely, but kind of upgraded it with two nice properly cushioned seats as opposed to this. But at least in this car, my feet touch the ground, so I don't feel like a little child. <laughs> 
So despite the Range Rover being 74 miles long, it actually doesn't have a particularly large boot. You can get a couple of suitcases in here, but there's not a great deal of space. You don't get as much encroachment of the wheel arches as you did with the Rolls-Royce. No, it's a boxy space. but Yeah, it's decent, but also you can put the seats forward as well, so you could, you've got the full length. What's under here, though? A dirty, great big spare wheel. Yeah, so you're not actually going to gain much there, are you? Proper wheel, though, isn't it? Proper wheel, look None at that. Foam horse shit. Nonsense. If you've got both of these open, you can just press the top button and it will close both. Little secret special button. <laughs> what have we done wrong? <laughs> Loads of space in the back of a Range Rover, as you would expect. Plenty of leg room, comfortable seats, not quite a Cullinan. So a long wheelbase version gives you at least another foot between your knees and the back of the seat, which is very similar to the Cullinan. All about the luxury in this car. Even the rear seats are cooled and heated for sir's pleasure during the summer and winter. Center of the rear seat, give it a tug down. Look at that, for holding your cups. Little place to put your phone, very nice. There is one downside to owning Range Rovers and that tends to be reliability or at least perceived reliability. These cars are considered to be a little bit troublesome and quite expensive to fix when they go wrong. So second hand, they're not worth a great deal of money because obviously you have to keep fixing them. Wow, here we go, Range Rover. Range Rover it is. Amazing. We talked about how good it is and now it's time to show you exactly why this is one of the greats. So now we're in it, we're just in. just take it all in. It's nice, isn't it? Do you remember it's exactly simple. what we said about the, in the Cullinan, about the classiest interiors, restrained, elegant. Simplicity not, of yeah, design, right? Exactly, not too many different materials. We've got this sort of light cream leather, which lightens the interior completely. Obviously, it's a little bit of a problem if you're wearing blue jeans. Most importantly, because it's a Range Rover, timeless classic. Timeless classic, indeed. Just like the Rolls-Royce Cullinan then, we've got an elevated seating position, loads yep. of glass. Yep. It feels like we're the master of the universe. It does give you that sense of uh, entitlement yep. sitting up here. The thing I noticed straight away, jumping out of the Cullinan and into this, this is nowhere near as wide as the Cullinan, so there's less space. It feels more claustrophobic in the cabin, which I cannot believe I'm saying, in a Range Rover. Range Rover. It's a bit yeah. pokey, but also noticeable straight away, it's so much more noisy than the Rolls-Royce, isn't it? You really it do appreciate noisy. how <laughs> quiet that car is because you get into this, which is a quiet, luxury yeah. 4x4, and actually, it's a bit of a din. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit like... I can hear a, a lot. Death concert in here compared to the Rolls Royce. <laughs> <laughs> Loads of tire noise, of tire bit noise. of wind noise. I mean, I would have said this is like one of the most quiet cars before, before I think I got in got it. Before you got into the colour. Yeah. Ride quality. Oh, it's not quite Rolls Royce, but it's bloody good. It's a little bit more agricultural than yeah. the Rolls Royce. I think when you crash over seams in the road and things like that, you get a bit more harshness coming in and a little bit more after wallow. One of the things that I struggled with in the Cullinan was that that amazing Rolls Royce feeling and the kind of off-road dichotomy. I wouldn't want to have taken it off-road because it didn't feel like it was right taking it off-road. Whereas this, honestly, I'd be looking for the nearest green lane. Yeah, the nearest stream to the Ford. Utilityness is what I love about it. Is that you know you fold the rear seats down, the kids go in the back, dog in the boot. It's so iconic, so much better than a Bentley. A lot of people were surprised. We said we'd rather have a Range Rover than the Bentley Continental, and people were like, "Hey, you can't compare those cars." And it's like, well, of course you can. Yeah, you can. They're both luxury vehicles. This one's a bit taller. Yep. It's not as fast, but it's a lot more practical. Yeah, it's more practical, and for the journey across France to the Swiss Alps, you know what's going to get up to the top, right? Definitely this. Definitely this. What we've got yeah. here is a luxurious, incredibly capable off-road vehicle. So it's brilliant on the road, it's brilliant off the road. Yeah. It's luxury in here as much as anyone really needs. And yet we're talking 80, 90 grand for one of these, not 
300,000. Yeah. However, the driving position is still the same. Yeah, which is... is since the 1970s. Imperious. Car. Upright, imperious. I am lord of all I survey. The shape of the car hasn't changed since the 1970s. Lovely and boxy and lots of glass. Signs like that that say mud on road, I care not a jot. Care not. You know, if we were coming down here in a Ferrari and we saw that sign, we would literally have to stop. We'd just pack probably up and push, go home. Probably yeah. push the car. Call a recovery truck. <laughs> nice bit of speed, turn of speed though. Good talk. Considering we're in yeah. four and a half litre V8, it's a diesel, it, it picks up its skirts and goes. It does run out of puff at about 50 miles an hour though. Yeah. Let's be honest. Yes, it does. I mean, it's good. The first initial zero to 30, you're a bit like, oh, blimey, that's, that's a way <laughs> and off. And then at 30, it goes, oh. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? Really? The view from the driver's seat, like the Cullinan, I've got digital but classical dials. So I've got yep. lovely classical analog dials, but done digitally, and they look fantastic. I've got a great steering wheel. I've got just enough gubbins on it to occupy me, but it doesn't get in the way. And it's all nice tactile material. The buttons are all good. In the new version, you've got two screens. You've got a touch screen for your main entertainment, and then you've yep. got a touch screen. Instead of this, the ventilation and everything and heating and cooling is all touch screen. Is it? Wow. And there is no need to do that because as the McLaren proves, if you put ventilation, to touch screen, you're forever accidentally tapping the screen and getting the yeah. wrong thing. You're either roasting or freezing. <laughs> what about the point you made in the Rolls-Royce episode about who owns these and about how ubiquitous they are? Well, that is a bit of an issue. And I'm not wearing enough sovereigns today to be in a Rolls-Royce. <laughs> <laughs> Half why didn't you, or full. Why didn't you wear your sovereigns? You knew we were doing this episode. <laughs> in deepest, darkest Essex, they do have a bit of a reputation for the type of people that own and drive them. You wouldn't see a bunch of bouncers in a full Fiesta, would you? Probably not. No. Or builders, for that matter. Pretty much every single one of these is black on black with black wheels. Yeah. And that completely changes the look yeah. and how people perceive you in the, this car. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's amazing though, isn't it, that the, that the same car can have this Jekyll and Hyde personality, sure. Yeah. depending on the owner and their tastes. This is that uniform, this is that badge of honor. It's to say, I've made it. This yeah. is the working man's Rolls Royce, if you like. This says to everybody around, I've made it, I've got a few quid. <laughs> We've got lots of terrain modes in this sort of center console. And over the years, you've had various sort of like big levers and huge industrial sort of things to control it. Yep. Now you've just got a little a little sort of twiddly thing here, which selects the different modes. Unlike the Cullinan where you just press one button and said, I would now like to go off road. Yes, the and, single off road button. And it sorts it all out. <laughs> this one, you've got a bit more control. A bit more engagement. But you have to tell it, like for example, driving through that Ford, yep. I'm like, well, which of these is a picture of a Ford so I'm, I've got it well I'm not going to go near a cactus am I going to drive near a Christmas tree no and I'm not going to go in snow so I was actually a bit perplexed as to which one I should put it on for a stream I would have gone I would have gone Christmas tree have you seen those videos yeah incredible yeah but this is like it this is it the stones up in front of the front wheels yeah to make it go slower I mean that is just incredible that I think is also one of the things about having this car that can go anywhere. Yeah, if you wanted to turn right and go across the field, why you had the correct tyres on it? What, right now, yeah? Yeah, let's do it now. <laughs> this will go pretty much anywhere, and it means it's maintained the short overhangs at each end, the front and the back, mm -hmm. to allow you to still do that. Lots of four-wheel drive cars, you know, or four-wheel drives that purportedly are four-wheel drive cars, have much bigger overhangs, and so you can't get the, the angle of ascent and descent that you can in a Range Rover. So a couple of things I don't really like about this car, they're small niggly things, admittedly. If you put in a destination on the sat-nav that yep. you want to go to, but you don't press the go button oh, right. yet, yeah, yeah. but then say you put it in reverse, All right. it wipes it. What? Yeah, because the camera comes up and then that wipes whatever you had on the sat-nav. 
that's a bit annoying also it's got a uh, cubby hole here in the door so we've got beautiful piano wood lovely Ooh. swooping shapes yeah, all like this is this. sculpted nice, yeah. yeah you've got this lovely sort of metal handle for opening the okay, door well. but it has such a little tiny sort of catch to pull it open I'm forever snapping my nails on it it's oh, horrible no, it's terrible it's it really really nasty the number of times I've also even on this door handle just caught my fingers fingers in it as I've opened it and the big it's quite a big heavy door You're right, it'll just pinch yeah yeah and the cornering is fairly flattish yeah I mean it holds itself up well we're not considering how tall it is handles, are we? yeah considering it's nearly two meters tall it gets around corners very well you got cubby holes, you got like bins, you got a fridge in there. Fridge. Oh, I love the, I love the old fridge. How the about fridge that? Is brilliant. I know. You never realise how much you want a fridge in Until a car. You have one in a car. It is not easy to park in Waitrose, <laughs> is it? It's not easy to park on planet Earth. Check out this massive panoramic roof, though, just like the Cullinan. I'm loving that. Look at it. it. Certainly helps to light up the interior. We spoke about it earlier. The TV, I can see it, but you can't. Yeah, it is quite clever, so actually. So I can watch a film yeah. while we're driving along, yeah. but you can't see it. Yeah, exactly. And you, and you get headphones as well. So somewhere in here, there oh, you go. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. So there's a pair of... You've got a pair of magic headphones. Oh, so they're not even connected. No, nope. so... Bluetooth or whatever. Right, right, right. So as I look at it from here, all yeah. I can see is, say, the sat-nav or the radio or something like that. Right. But at the angle that you're looking at it, you can see the television and hear the television. It's so amazing. So I can see, you know, there's something playing Do it. There move move, move so your head. Go... So you've got TV on there. Oh, my God. How does it do that, then? It's magic. It's sorcery. Do you know what that's like? Do you remember them rulers you had as a kid? Oh, yes. Oh, they were the amazing. Heroes. Oh. See, that's what it's like. Oh. But just grown up version. See, now you've said that, I am literally buying some of those rulers sure right You're now. You're going to be on eBay in a second. In a second. That's a bit crap. <laughs> Don't what? like that. What's that? What, the little uh, turny, turny gear yeah. selector? Yeah. What did you have in the, in the Discovery? Was it like a proper old it was big a dog proper leg? Proper old thing. So, you know, you can hear the engine, which obviously makes it automatically more uncouth than the Rolls Royce. <laughs> of course, because that was very much like a... <clears throat> Sorry, sir. I don't know why I've got paddles. No. No. Paddles it... are could not be more superfluous. You're could spot they? on, aren't you? I, I don't think, in all the time I've been driving this, I've never once thought I'm going to change it down to manual and engage no. some sporty driving. I no, agree with you. Totally pointless. Utterly pointless. They're, they're a gimmick. The other thing... We're in a Range Rover, yet yeah, they've still got a Land Rover badge on there. I wonder how many people are actually upset. You know what I mean? <laughs> it does. It hasn't upset me. I have to well, say. Well, no, because you're a normal person. But, mm. but I know I'm what you mean. Fairly certain that there are some people that go, oh, not a Land Rover. Would it have been too much to just change it to Range? Yeah, exactly. Because everything it? else says Range Rover, right? It says Range Rover in lots of places everywhere, in here. Everywhere. Everywhere. Too many places. Apart from right where you're looking. I'll tell you another annoying thing about these cars. They put buttons to adjust the seat position on the side of the seats at the top here. Can you see that? Can you see some buttons? Yeah. Is that what that moves the seat backwards and forwards? Yeah. Now, why would, why you, would you do you, that? Why would you do that, given that the primary audience of this car would be families who've got children, children. with little wondering oh. hands? Oh, you would never. Why would, would you do that? All you're going to do is find yourself on a journey yeah. sliding backwards and forwards before you absolutely lose it. <laughs> <laughs> the brake pedal's a bit squishy. Squishy good? No, squishy bad. But I do like the way it handles. I like I, it, it's very flat, surprisingly good. So by pushing down this centre bit, I'm now in auto terrain response mode. Good lord. So I'm guessing that's similar to the Cullinan's yeah. off-road button. That's true, that must it's be like, that. It will determine what kind of surface we're travelling on. Yeah, for the lazy off-roader. And then you've got controls here for lowering the height. So for example, if you go into a multi-storey car park and it says we've only got 1.7 metres of height, you can press this button and lower the car to get in. I suppose to getting out and letting all the air out of the tyres, you mean? Yeah, the old-fashioned the old the old old way. <laughs> <laughs> and 
actually, you know what? It is quite a fun drive, this. Yeah, for such a big vehicle, it's surprisingly yeah, good, isn't it? it? Is. Average fuel economy, well, they reckon round about 30 mpg. Yeah. But look what we're averaging right now. Four? No, four. <laughs> yeah, look at the decimal point. <laughs> 34. 34. 34 miles a gallon on this old thing. What do you like about the Range Rover? Well, I think we like the classic shape, yep. the simple and classy interior. I think we like the ride, that it's still quite fun to drive, even though it's a boring SUV, essentially. It's ludicrously capable off-road. It's probably the best all-round car you're ever gonna buy. It's well-equipped, it's got loads of cool tech on it. It's yes. got that cool twin television-y type technology. Which is frankly amazing. Which is awesome. Witchcraft. And it's only, and I guess I caveat this only being yeah. 80,000 pounds, which is still a lot of money, but considering the rivals and considering yeah. the other cars in the class, it's, it's a pretty good deal, I think. Yeah, I think your, your money is, well, it's not safe because the depreciation on these things is horrendous. It's, I would consider buying a two to three year old one and letting someone else take the whack in the pocket. not like. Fuel economy when you're hoofing it is obviously disastrous. It's disastrous. The reputation of, of people who black them out and drive them yeah. is a bit of an issue. Yeah. Reliability has to be the Questionable. Biggest. So that's the biggest downside I think of a Range Rover. Otherwise I think it literally would be the perfect vehicle. I mean I've spoken to people who had their car in the garage longer than they've had it out of the garage. Yeah. There can be issues with aircon, there can be issues with gearbox, there can be issues with the air suspension. You know, if you're in the market for an SUV and you've got upwards of £60,000 to spend and you're looking to get a good solid family car, you can't really go wrong with this. If I was in the market for something to take me across the continent in luxury and I had a Bentley Continental sitting outside and I was taking the wife and the kids and I had this sitting outside, I'd take this. Yeah. But if you do buy one, don't black it all up, keep it nice and classy. So in summary, Jason, would you buy a Range Rover? Yes, of course I would buy a Range Rover. Would I buy a Range Rover? Yes. Thanks for watching the video, guys. I really hope you enjoyed our review of this Range Rover Vogue SE. Don't forget to click the notification bell, leave comments, hit subscribe, follow us on Instagram, and we'll catch you on the next one.